for over 27 years. We've been doing a series of um, Zone programs here for the last several months. This is part of our series, what we call uh, Aquaculture for Homesteading, Rural and Urban. This is our third session in this series. There's only four sessions uh, up and running for this. Uh, today, we're going to talk about recirculating aquaculture systems. And uh, Dr. Swartz down at Hampton Road uh, Seafood Lab uh, will be presenting the first paper uh, PowerPoint presentation today on uh, RAS, the ins and workings of it. And when he's done, I will be presenting a, a uh, PowerPoint presentation on water quality and some fish health, looking at both types of systems, aquaponics as well as hydroponic, uh, aquaponics and uh, recirculating aquaculture systems. So, you know, since we're Getting started, I appreciate everybody coming on. We have a chat uh, box. Uh, please put questions into it. We will be monitoring these uh, chat uh, box for questions. And if we see some pertinent questions come up, we will uh, refer it back to the speaker. Uh, but basically, if these questions can be waiting until the end of the speaker to be answered. We have one hour uh, for our presentation, but if necessary, we will always go over that one hour mark. We used to run these for two hours. We figured that's too long, so we shorten these uh, talks down to one hour blocks and we're doing this. If we do this every Tuesday at 10 o'clock and uh, we got uh, probably five more presentations to go in this block, but uh, we have a the fourth session in this series on home setting for aquaculture will be taking place uh, a week from today where we're gonna be talking about feed fishing, marketing and food safety. So with that introduction, uh, we got a short time ahead of us. I'm gonna turn it over to Mike for his presentation on recirculating aquaculture. All right, sounds good, David. Thanks for the intro. Uh, can everybody see a recircling aquaculture system slide covering the whole screen? Yes, sir. All right, we got the we got the right one. All right. Well, yeah, as David mentioned, uh, we'll be talking about uh, recirculating systems. Uh, again, these systems can be used for hydroponics, aquaponics, straight up aquaculture. We're really just talking about the system that's, uh, you know, turning the water, um, reusing the water. Let's see, this does not want to advance. There we go. So what are recirculating systems? Again, just to help a little bit with terminology. Um, we consider it a recirculating system when we recycle or reuse 90% or more of the water uh, on a daily basis. So, you know, if it's a thousand gallon tank and if you use less than a hundred gallons of new water a day, we can consider it recirculating. And if we're dealing with something like hydroponics, we're generally just dealing with loss from evaporation and uh, from the water that the plants take out. So you're really just make, doing makeup water. You're not even exchanging water. Um, but again, just to kind of give us a perspective of where we're going. And if we look at carrying capacity for fish in recirculating systems, we have a range of really anywhere from zero to about one pound per gallon of water. Um, we'll be talking about some different types of systems, but uh, as the pounds per gallon goes up, the systems get very complicated, very expensive. Uh, an average would be about a third of a pound of fish per gallon of water. So a 10,000 gallon tank would give us uh, about 3,000 pounds of fish um, at, at market time. So again, just to kind of give us a ballpark, but again, a less intensive system, you know, you could have a thousand pounds and 10,000 gallons. Um, really depends on how you design the system and how much you want out of it. 
Um, why do people look at recirculating aquaculture systems? They're, they really fall into what's called con controlled environmental agriculture. Um, there's, there's a lot of advantages. Uh, these systems are generally indoors. So we have, you know, really good animal security. We can keep pests out, pathogens, neighbors that want some of our fish maybe. You know, if they're in a building and the door's locked, nobody's getting in. So it gives us good security. Um, we're really independent from weather. Um, high temperatures, freezing temperatures, um, you know, times if you have fish in ponds, sometimes you won't be able to harvest because maybe it's been raining for two or three days and your, you know, your levees are muddy or what have you, uh, or it's too cold and you can't sane the fish. Well, these are indoor tanks, temperatures are maintained. So we can keep production and marketing really to whenever we want to need something out of the systems. Um, and they tend to, as compared to surface water systems, these recirculating systems have a low dependency on natural resources, which is land and water. You know, again, we can put it inside a building. So, you know, those are the reasons we see a lot of people moving into research systems. Um, but with advantages, there's disadvantages, and by far these are the most expensive systems to build and operate. Um, so those are things you have to take into account uh, when you're going to get into or thinking about getting into recirculating aquaculture system production. Um, you know, be looking at your business plans or be counting your dollars closely on what you're putting in and what you expect to get out. Um, and cooperative extension can help you with the business plans. Also, there's intensified biological risk. And this is whether you're doing plants, whether you're doing fish or shrimp or what have you. We're putting more animals and plants in a smaller area. And just by the way nature operates, when we put things in close proximity, there's a chance for diseases or pathogens to spread uh, and to spread quickly. And also the animals themselves will put loadings on the system, which we'll talk a little bit more about, which uh, are called biological uh, loading such as uh, ammonia and nitrites and we'll, we'll talk about some things like that. So again advantages and disadvantages, um, it's good to be aware of them. Uh, it helps you plan if this is a direction you want to go and if so um, some of the things that are following here will be you know, helpful for you. Um, these are the areas that we're going to talk about uh, that are the components of recirculating systems. Um, so we'll just kind of go into each one briefly and then I've added a, a poster on the end that we'll spend a little bit of time on as well. So the culture vessel, if you're going to be doing, you know, uh, fish, uh, probably more important and if, for shrimp they're looking for surface area, bottom space or vertical things they can hang on. Fish swim. So the shape of the tanks, uh, uh, are very important um, either for letting the fish swim, turn. We want the tanks to be self-cleaning. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about solids. You don't want solids just collecting on the bottom of the tank and then you have to go in and vacuum it out. That adds a lot of labor. While the solids are in the tank, they leach and create water quality issues. Uh, so we'll look a little bit about self-cleaning characteristics of the tanks, which is very I, important and often. Sir, I've noticed that, yeah, that takes a little bit of planning <laughs> on the self-cleaning characteristics. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah that takes a little thought. So we'll, get, we'll give you a, a couple ideas on the next slide. Um, and then the species being cultured. Again, if you're going to raise something like a rainbow trout, those fish tend to swim forward. Uh, they're long uh, and relatively skinny compared to a perch or a, a tilapia. So something like a trout needs to be able to swim in circles. A tilapia can stop, turn, he runs into a corner, he just turns around and it's not a problem for him. Huh. So let's just kind of look at really the three types of uh, or categories of tanks that we have. 
Uh, of course, the ram tank is probably the most common. Uh, can everybody see my mouse spinning around in the blue circle? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is a round tank, and here you got the water coming from the system. And so the water just kind of spins around. Well, what happens in here, just like it does at your pool at home, uh, the solids that will settle will collect right in the middle of, of the tank. So this is where we remove the water to go to the filtration system to come back in. So this is a very well-designed self-cleaning uh, design, and it's one of the reasons people use round tanks. Now, one of the issues with round tanks is we're putting these tanks inside buildings, and the square footage in your building has a cost. You can only put so many tanks in the building. Uh, the building has its own heating, cooling, construction, depreciation, what have you. So people have gone to four-sided, six-sided, eight-sided tanks, but rounding the corner so fish don't get stuck, this rounded corner hybrid still allows for good cleaning, no solids collection in the corners, but gives you about 31% more tank space on, for the floor space of the building. So that's really helpful. It basically lets you hold more water in the same square footage in the building. Um, we can look at a plug flow raceway, uh, common in the trout industry where water flows from out of a spring into one raceway, runs into the next raceway, into the next raceway, and then after four, five, six of these, it goes back into a pond or the stream or wherever it goes. Um, people try to gravitate towards these because they can find these, but as you can see, these don't circulate. The water comes from here goes out here, so you have really good water quality here, and then it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and by the time you get down here, you got very poor water quality. Hmm. Well, a solution for this is if you have this type of a tank, is you can build a de-ended raceway. Uh, it's basically the plug flow raceway with half a circle on each end, and then you put a wall from the bottom of the tank to the water surface or above, and again, here we see the water coming from the filtration system. We bring it in an angle, and this water is going to spin round and round and round and round all day, all night. Nice flow. Fish can swim in it, with it, against it. No corners to get stuck in. And on these, the places to pull the solids for self-cleaning <clears throat> are on the downstream side of the wall where there's an eddy. So the solids will collect here. They will collect here, or you can put a screen on the bottom and have a discharge on the bottom of the tank so that the solids fall to the bottom of the tank as they come down, and then they get pulled out here. So you, you got three points that you can pull solids out, again, to be self-cleaning. And so probably whatever you guys will come up with will be some combination uh, of these shapes. But most importantly, keep in mind self-cleaning and if the fish need to be able to swim without corners. So let's talk a little bit about solids. Um, this is another problem with recirculating systems. Again, if fish are in cages or in ponds, fish waste or uneaten feed just goes to the bottom of the pond or blows to the side of the pond and kind of goes away. But in research systems, any solids in the system stay in the system until you take them out. Um, basically, uh, fish waste, fish feces, and uneaten feed are the, are the main sources of your, uh, of your solids. But the problems are, until we get the solids out of the system, the longer they stay in, the more they degrade water quality. So they affect the health of the water, which affects the health of the fish. Um, since these solids are organic in nature, it increases bacterial loading. There's more bacteria with more solids, and these can be bacteria that cause diseases or illnesses. The solids are organic, so they use oxygen, which competes for the fish, and we'll talk about uh, oxygen in your system. 
And then very importantly, depending upon the fish species you raise, some fish are, are insensitive or cannot handle solids in the water column and a trout's a perfect example. If you have a lot of suspended solids and fine particulates that you see, if you beaker out some water and look at the water, the gills of the trout will very quickly get infected and you'll be calling Dr. Crosby because you have sick fish or dying fish and you might think, well, it's a disease, but it's really being caused by an environmental problem, which is your suspended solids. If you're growing something like a tilapia, they'll probably eat those uh, and pull some nutrition out of them. So the types of systems that you put in uh, and the degree that you need to clean the water will also depend upon the types of fish that you're going to raise. And we'll look at those here with the kind of the simple types of filters that you may be looking at uh, for your systems. This here is a sand filter. That's just a regular pool filter. And they work well for low loaded systems, lower temperature systems. The problem with sand filters is they'll tend to cake and when you backwash, they don't backwash properly from the organics. Um, but people do use these. You can uh, open them up and clean the sand manually once in a while between backwashes. You can build swirl separators uh, or radial flow separators. Um, you can look these up online a little bit if you want. You can easily build these at home uh, and they work very well uh, and they just use passive gravity flow in and out. Uh, so there's no actual media, um, solids just collect in each of these on the bottom and then we can drain it out. This would be a drop filter or a bead filter. This is getting more into the commercial types of filters that you can buy. Um, work very well. They all work a little bit differently. Um, but this is when you're starting to buy equipment off the internet. These are the types of things that you'll find for, for solids removal. Uh, in aquaculture systems. We need to talk a little bit about biological filtration. We already had a little discussion about that uh, with some folks before this started. All the animals that we produce <clears throat> as they feed and metabolize, they all produce ammonia, uh, which is toxic at very low levels. Remember the fish live in the environment that they excrete their wastes in. So in a pond or in a stream, we have low densities of animals and we just have natural bacteria that clean everything. Everything in a recirculating system is more concentrated. So we have to actually build biological filters, which really just provide surface area for aerobic bacteria that will convert ammonia to nitrite and nitrite to nitrate. And we would test for these all on a daily basis to monitor the health of the system because this is really what drives the health of the animals, how many animals you can hold, and thus how much feed you put in, which is what produces the uh, um, ammonia nitrite. So this is like the heartbeat of your system and you want to monitor this very closely. Um, also note it's aerobic. So this is also an oxygen demand on your system. And we'll look at that next. Here's another design of a biological filter. This is a rotating biological contactor. Again, it's air driven or water driven with paddle wheels in the middle. And this just kind of spur turns maybe once a minute and the bacteria go in the water, get ammonia nitrite, then they come out of the water, use some atmospheric oxygen and they do this conversion. Low tech, low cost to operate. You can get into more commercial systems that are called mixed bed bioreactors or uh, uh, fluidized beds. Um, that these work there. very efficiently. They have very high uh, ammonia and nitrite removal rates. And it's basically just a tank that you aerate so it bubbles. And these types of media just kind of float up and down and boil like spaghetti. And the bacteria will adhere on the surfaces of this and do all of your nitrification. So this is the ins and outs of your biological filters. Their efficiency is based upon 
uh, surface area per volume. So the higher the surface area per unit volume, the more effective your biofilter should be. Just like a tank, just like your fish tank, you want to make sure your biological filters are self-cleaning and not collecting solids. So in this case here, you'll have your aerators all the way on the bottom so you don't get a dead space where solids can collect. You want your biofilters also to be self-cleaning, just like your fish tanks. Solids should only collect in your solids collection devices. Some do both. They collect solids and do nitrification. This is an example here of a, uh, a bubble bead filter. You can buy these online. Here's an inside picture. The dirty water comes in from the fish tank. It goes through here. The solids collect on the beads. Um, as the water goes through the beads, there's also bacteria. So it converts the ammonia to nitrite to nitrate, and then it leaves. The problem with these is the solids collect on top of the bacteria. So this biofilter does not work the same between backwashes. It goes from really clean and effective after you backwash to probably less than half active area by the time you have to backwash it again. So be careful on your calculations if you use something that removes solids and does biofiltration at the same time. Uh, it can get you into trouble. I would use something like this just for solids removal and then have a biofilter afterwards. Let's talk about oxygen. Whether it's fish or shrimp, they gotta have it. Uh, and as we can see on this slide, there's lots of things that are taking the oxygen out of the water. The fish, of course, are using it or the shrimp, whatever we're growing. So that's a net loss of oxygen. We talked about the biofilter being aerobic, the bacteria converting the ammonia to nitrite and nitrate use oxygen. And we have biological oxygen demand, just bacteria that are in the water, that are on the solids in the water, which is why we want to get rid of those. And then also a small amount of chemical oxygen demand, which we usually don't calculate for. But these all uh, take oxygen out of the water. And if you have a very intensive system with lots of fish, you can go to lethal conditions literally within minutes of a power failure, depending upon your oxygen supply. So you have to have emergency backups. But oxygen demand, it's a very important to understand where it comes from. And then here we can look at some of the ways that we get the oxygen back. For low tech systems, low density systems, it's very simple. This is just a regular uh, pond aerator that you float between two strings to the side of a tank. There's a propeller under the water. It splashes the water into the air and you can see there's lots of contact and there's lots of oxygen being tra transferred by one small, maybe a third horsepower uh, floating aerator. These work very fine in tanks. Um, we can use uh, rotary vane air blowers. This is a typical one you buy from uh, an online catalog for aquaculture supplies. And this just compresses regular air. It sucks it in through this filter, compresses it, compresses it here in a rotary vane, and then you blow it through air stones in the bottom of the tank. Very effective. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind, both of these require electricity, which is a cost. And the more oxygen you need, because you have more fish and you feed more, you need more oxygen. You have to have bigger aerators or more aerators. And then at some point, you get to a point where you can't get enough oxygen from these two, and then you end up buying pure oxygen. For anybody that's just getting into aquaculture, I would say stay away from systems where you need pure oxygen. Stick with these types of passive aeration devices, but keep the pure oxygen around for emergencies. Um, in case you lose power, your aerator breaks or something. And the nice thing is you can just have an oxygen tank and you can have it on a solenoid where power is on, the solenoid is closed. And then if the power cuts off, the solenoid opens and then you have it already preset with flow meters to your air stones. So for the price of a small solenoid, if the power goes out, your fish tank will automatically get predetermined amounts of pure oxygen. 
while you get your alarm, while you drive to the fish barn or wherever you are. There's fairly simple ways to set up emergency aeration before you get people there. So just something to think about before your first power failure results in lots of dead animals. Talk briefly about water movement. Remember, we need to move the water in the tank for the fish. We need to move the water in the tank so that the solids go to the uh, uh, area where we're going to pull them out. And we need to move the water through the recirculating system. So we've got to go from the tank to the solids filter, to the biological filter. So we can use regular impellers. These are like pool pumps, jacuzzis. We can use airlifts, again, for low density systems. An airlift may be a good way. The same thing that does aeration can move your water. This is just like an airlift in your aquarium. The bubble comes in, goes up, it pulls the water with it, and comes out the top. And then we have propeller pumps like you use in agriculture. Uh, these produce very high flow rates with very low head, very low electrical consumption but they, they can only lift the water efficiently probably six to eight inches. <clears throat> so it's a, way, it's a way to mechanize an airlift where there's very low head differentials. With these types of pumps here, you can pump the water up 10, 15 feet, 10, 15, 20 PSI. Keep in mind, the more you pressurize the water, the higher you pump it, the more electricity you're gonna use. All the parts we're talking about on a system, you wanna keep in mind the operational cost. What does it cost you every day to you know, supply the electricity? How long does the equipment last, et cetera? And very briefly, water disinfection or sterilization. Uh, UV is very common. Here the water comes uh, from your research system after it's been polished, comes down here and there's a sleeve in here with a UV bulb. The water, basically the bacteria and viruses can be killed by the UV. And then the clean water here is going to the biofilter. So we can uh, do some fairly simple disinfection with different doses of UV. Protein skimming is a nice way to remove small suspended particles and dissolved organics. You can Google these online or refer back to this PowerPoint, which will be made available. Here's just some pictures of some small ones that you can buy. Uh, if this system had a lot of fish in it, you'd see tons of brown bubbles coming out of here, going down this tube into your collection bucket, and every day you'll pick out two or three gallons of what looks like the end of your coffee pot after you left it on all day. <coughs> Those are very difficult things to filter out, but you can very effectively pull them out with protein skimming. So something to keep in mind if you have to have really clean water for your fish, like for trout. Again, we're just bouncing through some of the stuff you'll find online when you look at systems. Here, we'll just look at a couple of very simple systems. Here we can see six independent systems. Each has its own little bead filter. In this case, we're using them for solids removal and biological filtration. These were low density systems we were doing uh, flounder production in. Again, you can see how you can stack them nicely. Not utilizing the floor very well. Um, again, this is a research environment. If this was a production floor, you'd want all your tanks very close together, just enough space to walk between and harvest. So you could put as many tanks as possible into the room. But you can see these things stack very nicely. We have the rounded corner tanks work very nicely. Simple designs. Uh, here's one where they're producing, you can do minnows or fish for the ornamental trade if you want to do angelfish or guppies. Here the system is all on the bottom. We have solids removal, biological filter, UV sterilization, and then the water comes back up into all these tanks. So these are all independent tanks, individual tanks, but they all flow on this main system. So we can have different life stages. Again, lots of different ways to do it. You can just buy glass aquaria and you can connect them to a system like this. Very, very easy to do. And here's a shot kind of of an integrated aquaponics uh, tank. Here's where the tilapia or uh, perch are in this case. Then we go through our solids uh, filter and biological filter, and then it goes up into the plants, which of course now are gonna remove the nitrates. And then this is all gravity flow to here, gravity flow here. 
and then gravity flow back to your tank. One of your rules of thumbs is you only want to pump water once and let design move it through the rest of your systems. And I think here, we think we're doing lettuce and a few different things. So you can see a very, very simple, very clean system, nothing fancy, um, works very well. So just in review, uh, for design considerations, are you raising trout or tilapia or catfish or, you know, what do those fish want and need? That's going to impact the shape, design, and water flows in your tanks. Um, what life stages, if you're producing fingerling, they generally need cleaner water um, than adult fish that you're doing grow out on. Uh, and Young fish need more exchange rates. Again, they need super, super clean water compared to grow out. So life stage is important. Maybe you're gonna produce fingerling to sell to other farmers. Well, a fingerling system is gonna be different than a grow out system. So just kind of keep those in mind. Where are you gonna do it? Look at your water sources. You know, do you have good groundwater? Um, is that groundwater, does it make it through droughts? You know, talk to other farmers or people in the area, what happens over 10 years? When was the last drought? Were the wells still running good or did the water quality change? Um, you know, how, how intense do you want to run the systems? These are all important to how much water you may use. Remember we talked about exchange rates. And then uh, buying the equipment. It's very easy to just buy a turnkey system off the internet. Problems are you're probably going to spend a lot of money. And then is that equipment that you can get locally serviced at your local garage or local handyman mechanic, or maybe that's you? Um, make sure it's stuff that you can replace effectively. Look at your energy costs. Look at your power demand curves on your pumps and your pressures. Uh, you know, it's usually gallons and then head pressure. So you want to have high gallon low head pressure uh, for energy efficiency. So always calculate those. Look at durability, serviceability. Again, you don't want stuff that, you know, the pumps come out of Europe or something, which happens. And then it, it's really expensive to, uh, to replace or repair. If we just want to look at trends, um, probably the most common one is people are looking for higher value animals, particularly smaller producers. And they don't sell into commodity markets, they sell into niche markets. So if you're producing trout or tilapia or purchase food fish on a small scale, to be economically viable, you're gonna try to sell direct to the end consumer, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's somebody that's gonna come by and buy the fish for, for their house, uh, or for their fish fry or whatever they're doing. You, you try to knock out the middleman, so that you retain more of the value. And people are always looking for the next high value species. So depending where you are, look to see what people are around you look for. Or the small restaurants, the mom and pops, you know, they're probably buying Cisco or something. See if they're interested and what would they be interested in? Um, again, we got lots of different things uh, that are being grown in Virginia, freshwater, saltwater, brackish. Ornamental, it doesn't have to be for food. It could be to sell to pet stores or uh, different places. It could be for stock enhancement. Here's some freshwater prawn uh, that were produced. Uh, here's a prawn farm. Hybrid striped bass are a favorite for uh, freshwater recirculating systems. And then as promised, this is at the end, so you will have a copy of this. This is kind of a combination of good aquaculture practices for research systems. Here you can see a little bit of some design suggestions on percents of flow rates to different parts of the systems. There's different suggestions for water qualities, uh, system operations, marketing. Um, so again, there's just uh, found this would be a value to put in. It's part of a series we, we put together with David and Brian and others. Uh, this one was particular for research systems. So there's lots of good common sense things in here uh, that would help, that will help you as you design or improve your systems.
So this has been tacked onto the PowerPoint that you guys will have available and um, you can read through it uh, uh, later at your convenience. And as always, you can reach out to any of us uh, at Virginia Cooperative Extension for any questions in the future, problems, uh, reach out anytime. And okay. that, I'll hand this back over. Okay, uh, Mike, and I guess this can be for you and or David, but um, can, let's see, wait, hold on, let me get back up here. Can the particulate from protein skimming be used in compost? I asked the person if they were just raising fish or if they also plan to use some of that affluent for fertilizing plants, and they said both. So um, can you give us some input? Absolutely, that's a very good question and the answer is absolutely. So long as this isn't a salt system, as long as it's a fresh water, there's gonna be very concentrated fine solids uh, as well as nutrients. You would wanna run these through a, either as a soil application uh, or if you're gonna put this into a hydroponics, you might wanna just run it through a little uh, biological reactor to convert everything into uh, nitrates. Remember, a lot of what's gonna be in here is gonna be the actual organics that haven't been broken down yet. So the solids you can compost, the dissolved solids you can uh, you know, put into a small reactor and produce lots of nitrogen, nitrate. But yes, there's a lot of value in that. If you're looking at a sustainable system we're trying to, where you're trying to keep everything, this is concentrating a lot of the stuff that you would wanna use if you're gonna grow plants. Very good question. Yeah, I was gonna say, Mike, you know, yes is definitely to all this stuff. The best thing that is on this system is when you do a, a decouple system from a RAS to a hydroponics, taking the solids and everything else. We've been doing that with small aquaponics systems on a decoupled uh, basis and it works very well. You know, because it allows you to add fertilizer if you need to, to make sure that your plants are growing properly. So yes, you can do this. Great stuff for your garden. And then there's another one. Um, are chemicals that are used to remove chlorine or chloramine from urban uh, water systems that are used in the RAS units approved for use in food production systems? I'm going to say 99.9, .9, yes. Yeah. Uh, I've not seen a circumstance where they're not. Yeah, we've been using that stuff for years. Yeah. So it's approved because they probably use those in uh, some uh, waste treatment plants, some of those chemicals sometimes. But um, go back to the composting question. If they have extra solids, that would probably be ideal to compost. And then the affluent or compost tea or whatever you want to call it, the, uh, the tea, the that has the fertile, the liquid fertilizer in it that you run through the plants, then, you know, that of course can be taken up by the plants. I just wanted to clarify that a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And I just backed up to the solids equipment. When you backwash these systems, you're going to get a very concentrated solids coming out. So that would be very good to go to compost because that's going to be very heavily solids laden. So that's something you would put into compost. Um, in fact, uh, Mike, I think you could probably go directly into your garden bed with some of this stuff because it is lots of organic materials to begin with and just work it into your soil. Well, and, your but some of the raw stuff you want to be very careful uh, as far as like from a food safety standpoint. Uh -huh. to yeah, because it's, it's possible to have fecal coliforms, E. coli, uh, it's possible to have these from different things that may be in your barn. Maybe a rat ran through at night over the rafters and yeah. pooped in the water. So composting will take care of all that. Uh, that's all the questions I see in the chat box. I don't think I've missed anything. Okay. 
yeah. Mark, I'll go be up next, and you got the uh, the PowerPoint for me, please. Oh, here we go. Okay, expand that up if you don't mind. There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, this section, we're going to cover a little bit about water quality and fish health. There's going to probably be some redundancy, but that's okay. Uh, water quality is one of your most important aspects of raising fish in any kind of system. And basically, we're going to be kind of talking a little bit about aquaponics and mass. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, basically, uh, aquaponic systems tend to be smaller scale. Uh, water quality issues can occur in these systems. Uh, you still need to be monitoring the, the water quality for uh, toxic ammonia, pH, and things of that nature. Uh, but it's a little bit different than uh, a larger scale. Next slide, please. You know, a big, huge uh, RAS operation, uh, their problem is going to be more different and different uh, situation, different critical things are going to affect them more so because the intensity of raising fish, trying to get more fish per gallon of water versus aquaponic system, which tends to be far less fish per gallon. Next, next slide. Regardless of uh, the situation, yeah, it doesn't matter if you're raising fish in ponds, tanks, aquaponics, or recirculating aquaculture system, fish kills will occur. Next slide, uh, hit the button again. And and you don't want to see fish with X's on their eyes. That means you just lost a lot of money. So basically, you need to be aware of what will kill your fish in these systems. Next slide. Just to understand how things work, why fish die, why we have have uh, problems with uh, uh, diseases and water quality, uh, hit the button again. Hit the button again. And hit the button again. There we go. Basically, we're looking at aquaponics, uh, rest system. We're looking at the environment. You got to realize we're using a biofilter. We're actually trying to create an artificial environment to take care of the water quality. If the water quality in these systems get bad, we also have pathogens. There's pathogens out there, and we got hosts, our fish. So we've got these three components that are involved in our fish health model. If the environment goes bad, next slide, please. Go ahead and hit the button a couple of times, please. We get a disease situation. The environment merges the pathogens and hosts together to create a disease situation out there, or, or the water quality gets so bad that we end up with a disease situation. So water quality environment drives many of our fish health issues. Next slide. Uh, Again, this is going to be our key to, uh, to our fish health is environmental stress. And again, we don't want to see a tank full of dead fish because we ignored our water quality monitoring uh, for other crawls for doing this. Next slide. Okay. The other aspect that's going to keep our fish healthy and alive and everything else, we need to look at what are what is our practices that we're doing? What is our husbandry? What is, we need to look at having good fish husbandry. You know, we've got to look at stocking rates. You know, we're, you know, if we've got a small aquaponic system, we don't want to try to force a pound per gallon in a system like that. So we need to look at those kind of things. You know, how many pounds per gallon we're, we're trying to push into these systems is critical. 
you know, what is our feeding? How are we feeding these fish? Again, feeding is a pretty important because feed is what's going to de deteriorate the water quality of these systems. And if the, again, if the water quality uh, deteriorates, we're going to have issues. And again, we got to be looking at our at our uh, biofilters. So water quality management, feeding rates, stocking rates is some of the critical things we want to look at is for having good fish husbandry. Next slide. Okay. Uh, depending on the level of production that you're trying to do, you're going to probably want to have some kind of water quality test kit. Whether or not it's a uh, uh, type that you get down at your aquarium store or where not you go ahead and spring and get yourself a professional water testing kit. If you're doing uh, recirculating aquaculture systems, you definitely go have a decent kit to measure the water quality. And things that we want to look at for testing, you know, hardness, alkalinity, pH, total ammonia, nitrogen, tan, even chlorides might be something we, and temperature and nitrite. So these are some of the basic water quality test kits, uh, parameters that we need. You might want to get one that does nitrates too. So, because you want to know how much nitrates you get into your system, that's going to be good for your plants. Uh, again, these systems can, uh, you can buy little strips or small test kits that run for $20, $30, all the way up to kits that cost $350. Next slide. Again, the artificial ecology is what's going to keep your water quality good. Again, Mike talked about the biofilter. Again, you, you know, she got these beads, the surface areas is critical. More surface areas you have, more bacteria is going to grow. Another thing is you got to make sure that these beads are always moving and not getting clogged. If these start getting clogged, you're not going to have a good biofilter. Next slide. Again, just simplistic uh, picture view of what a biofilter does. The fish and feed is going to be ammonia. It's going to be uh, getting ammonia oxidizing bacteria, uh, nitrite ox oxidizing bacteria, and we're going to get nitrates to be used for the plant. So we got the, the bugs on the uh, biofilter, the bacteria on the biofilter, and it's going to produce the nitrates for the plants. Next slide. A little bit more uh, detail here. You know, fish waste, food excess, any kind of organic matter, matter gets in your system is going to be great. It's going to create uh, ammonia problems. We're talking about total ammonia nitrogen, uh, unionized and ionized ammonia. Unionized ammonia is what toxic to fish and unionized ammonia is not. So we got to watch out how much uh, unionized ammonia we have in the system. The higher the pH, higher temperature, more toxic ammonia we have. Again, we got these aerobic bacteria, nitrous ammonas, that produces the nitrates. And nitrite, NO2s, can be toxic to fish. That can cause some problems too. The nitrobacteria, nitrates, you know, you got your plants, some algae, they're always algae growing somewhere, especially if you got a greenhouse and a and a uh, small aquaponic system, and then eventually to nitrogen in the atmosphere. Next slide. Again, uh, just to show you that there's sometimes a lag time. You know, you always get your ammonia spikes first, then your nitrite, then your nitrate. And it could take up to uh, two to three weeks for this biofilter to really get matured. Next slide. Again, just looking at the different biofilter medias, there's a lot of them. If they get clogged, they won't work. So you gotta keep an eye on this. You know, if you're not getting your solids out of the systems, the solids will plug up the biomedia and then you won't have your artificial ecology or biofilter not working. Then you go see all sorts of extreme uh, problems with your water quality like ammonia, 
special ammonia nitrites. Next, next slide. Oxygen level is very critical. Um, some, if you're going to be in this professionally raising fish and re recirculating aquaculture system of any kind of intensity, it pays to invest into a meter. If you're a small scale operation with a back, uh, backyard aquaponics system, you probably not going to need this, but you still want to be able to check your water quality for different uh, parameters like ammonia, pH, and stuff like that. Again, if, P, if the uh, oxygen levels fall below five in a system, you can have some problems. Once you start hitting around three, you're looking at very lethal uh, oxygen levels. You know, some species are more tolerant. Uh, tilapia is known to uh, somehow survive lethal levels of low oxygen, but not all of them. Any fish will succumb to low oxygen levels. Next slide. Again, aeration, make sure that you get an aeration not only to your fish, but also into your biofilter. Next slide. Again, hardness is pretty important. If you want these systems to function properly, make sure you have adequate levels of calcium in the system. Some species need hardness in the system and they won't grow or you will have problems. Hybrid striped bass is one of these systems. I like to see uh, hardness at least around 100 parts or better in a system. Uh, calcium chloride works. Uh, anything, uh, calcium carbonate works too. Anything that you can get the calcium into the system because your biofilter and plants are going to need it as well as your uh, fish are going to need calcium in the system. So this is something that you would check on a regular basis. Next slide. Uh, alkalinity, this is your carbonates and bicarbonates in the system. You can see there's a, a strip system. You don't have to spend uh, $350 for, for a uh, test kit. You can buy these strip systems uh, for about $15 and you get anywhere about 50 to 100 strips in a system. And that can check your water quality pretty easily. We want to be putting sodium bicarbonate. This is something I would check on a, on a daily basis because if your carbonates, bicarbonates uh, get very low, your system's not going to work very well. Uh, look at how much feed you're going. You want to add some sodium bicarbonate on a regular basis. And I like to maintain at least about 100 parts per million. This is also going to help buffer the uh, water for the pH change in the system so we don't get real high spikes or real low. Typically in recirculating aquaculture, aquaponic systems, we always see a drop in pH to low levels and we see them get down very, very low. We're not going to see our biological filter operate. Next slide, please. pH. This is critical. Uh, once you start getting down below seven uh, in a system, uh, your filtering system, the bacteria not going to operate. Plants like lower pH, you know, pH 6.5 is probably great for tomatoes, but not for the uh, biofilter. So we want to look at this, look at the, the pH every day. And there are simple systems out there that don't cost a whole lot of money. But this is something I would look at every day to see what it's doing. If the pH starts dropping, you know, that means your biofilter uh, needs some more alkalinity in the system to get it going, or, or you're going to end up with a biofilter that's collapsing on you. So check this on it every day. Uh, I don't expect to see lethal pH in these systems, but we do like to see it somewhere in the seven and a half range in these systems. Next slide. Okay. We talked about water quality earlier, about how the biofilter, how we go from ammonia to nitrites. Nitrites is a, can be a problem in the system uh, for different species of fish. Catfish and 
rainbow trout are very sensitive to nitrites in the system. Uh, tilapia, not so much. Uh, bluegills, not so much. So the species of fish you're dealing with will be affected differently for nitrites. Basically what nitrites do, uh, the NO2 gets into the bloodstream, attaches to the hemoglobin, and this prevents oxygen molecules attaching, which causes uh, a toxicity effect. It turns the uh, fish blood brown. There's an example of what, a, what normal blood looks. The top picture of a catfish shows brown, and that's due to nitrite toxicity. Uh, any kind of chlorides in the system will help prevent this toxicity problem happening, and it probably will not be enough chlorides to affect your plants. Uh, common salt is what we use. Next slide, please. Okay, again, total ammonia nitrogen. This is going to be the killer in your system. Uh, you know, you're putting a lot of organic stuff into the system, feed, waste, and your biofilter is trying to move this through the system into nitrates and nitrogen. Again, it doesn't take a whole lot of... Um, of ammonia in, in the system, especially the, uh, the unionized ammonia. And there's a graph there that shows the two types of ammonia in the system. As we climb in pH and temperature, we get more toxic ammonia, which is the, uh, hello? Uh, the the uh, unionized uh, ammonia. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Okay, quickly, we're getting close to the end. Uh, temperature relationships and diseases are quite commonly known. Certain diseases will grow only at certain temperatures. Uh, so, you know, monitoring the temperature of your system is a good idea. Next slide. Again, uh, uh, depending on your system, if you have a large uh, recirculating aquaculture system, you definitely want to look at some kind of uh, biosecurity plan using HACCP principles to develop it. There's a lot of publications right now that's out there because you don't want to end up getting some kind of pathogen that results in some kind of quarantine that does happen. I've known farmers that have been quarantined due to pathogens. Next slide, please. Okay, and so basically we want to keep the bugs out. Not these particular bugs, but we want to keep uh, fish bugs out. Next slide. Again, uh, a fish has a wormy life. These are just all the little critters that you can find just one species of fish. I mean, there's a lot of different parasites, a lot of different worms that gets in the fish. And it's just a matter of knowing where to look for them to find them. So we want to try to keep some of these problems out of our system. Next slide. Okay, biosecurity, depending on your situation. Uh, we have a situation where all trucks going into the facility go through some kind of disinfectant, you know, foot baths, you know, keeping your uh, materials clean, uh, not using the same net for everything on the farm, things of that nature. So uh, make sure that uh, on your biosecurity, you start with people. People is what you got to watch out for. That's the uh, controlling factor of biosecurity is limiting people into the system. Next slide. Okay, here are just some simple things disinfecting. Dr. Crowley, we just lost you. things get rid of dead fish you know we're talking about checking water quality things of that nature uh, make sure you do this on a daily basis next slide okay 
Uh, the other thing we want to be aware of when it comes to any kind of disease situation is look for behavioral changes. Behavioral changes is usually one of the first indication that we're having a problem. Feeding behavior, swimming behavior, some kind of erratic swim behavior, uh, fish conjugated around the edge or coming up to the surface, doing all this erratic behavior. It could be because of ammonia uh, spike in the system or things of that nature. So look for behavior. If you see a change in behavior, there could be a problem with diseases. Next slide. Again, just to show you that uh, uh, a couple of diseases are common in some of the systems. Uh, and I'm going to have some tilapia here because everybody thinks tilapia is an invincible fish. They're not. They can get sick and they can get diseases. Here's a tilapia with some aromonas lesions that died from that, had an aromonas infection. Uh, they get, get sick from that. So that's one of the bacterial diseases that can't, we actually see aromotis with and other species of fish in these systems like bluegills. So if we get that environmental stress, aromotis is one of the first bacteria that can come in and cause us some problems. Next slide. Next slide. Let's see. There we go. Um, streptococcosis can be a problem for systems, especially large recirculating systems. Uh, we haven't seen this in small systems. We've been monitoring, doing some surveys of small aquaponic systems. Uh, one of the things we've been looking for is for streptococcus in these systems. One thing that we want to watch out for is one of the problems that strep can do to a system is cause a very uh, bad mortality problem, which could end up being a complete shutdown and, and uh, disinfecting the whole system. One of the things that we want to look out for is uh, parasites in the fish. Uh, Gyrodactylus is a uh, protozoa, uh, is a, a uh, parasite, a motogenic uh, parasite that can get on the gills and skin. And there's a lot of uh, papers and indication that these things have a nice anchor hook system that hurts the epidermis, uh, makes breaks in the gills that allows for streptococcus to get in. Next slide. Okay. Uh, Another common parasite that we see on these uh, fish in these systems is Prectodina, which is this uh, protozoan parasite. It's, I call it the flea of the, of the fish world. Next slide. Hit the button. There we go. And these things can be pretty intense on a fish. Okay, another one to look out for is uh, another protozoan. Now you can go ahead, that's fine. Another prozone we want to look at is ick, which is a uh, ciliated protozoan it gets on fish. This is something that you would not suspect uh, getting it into a system because you got a control system, you fish control. However, uh, other species of fish like bluegills that are, are typically can carry something like this that you stock into a, into a system. Uh, if you're stocking in light where the temperatures are below 80 degrees, it can form in your system. And for go stock bluegills, I tend to stock them uh, for the summertime when our temperatures are tanks are going to be above 80. Otherwise, you're going to have to have a uh, start controlling these things as long as water temperature is below 80 degrees. So this this stuff can happen even in a recirculating system even though uh, ick is one of the things you find in pond fish. Next slide. Ick, there's just a picture of ick. Next slide. Okay. Okay. 
what are your contingency plans? So you're having a situation, you're having problems, you're looking at your fish, it's hanging upside down, you happen to look at the gills and just see tons of parasites all over the place. I mean, it's uh, packed in uh, at high density. So what do you do? What are your plans? How do you go deal with this situation? How do you go treat this situation? Who you go call? Who you go bring in to take care of the problem? Uh, these are all things that you got to ask yourself and have some kind of contingency plan to take care of this situation. So when you see dead fish popping up, so what do you do? Have a plan. Next slide, please. Now, who, what do you do? You call somebody that knows something about fish. Uh, next slide. Yeah, there's fish health specialists, there's veterinarians out there, there's uh, fish health researchers, there's aquaculture specialists that can help you on uh, with your problem. Next slide, please. There we go. Next slide. Let's just keep going. Next slide. And just because somebody works in fish health doesn't mean they can't uh, raise fish. Uh, again, uh, under COVID-19, uh, we're not at the farm anymore. But we do have phone, phone numbers, and we can try to help you out the best we can. Uh, again, fish never get sick during regular office hours. We don't have regular office hours anymore. So, you know, things happen at midnight on Saturday night. You know, that's when problems occur. So have a contingency plan, have some biosecurity and everything else. Next slide, please. Okay, take home here. Uh, having a healthy aquatic environment for fish is critical. That's the reason we have uh, water test kits to keep an eye on things like ammonia in the system, pH, mm -hmm. check, check the alkalinity. We want to make sure make sure we have good fish husbandry, not trying to stock too many fish in a small aquaponics situation, or if we have a large rat system, we're trying to get a lot of fish in there, make sure that we have adequate oxygen levels for them, test the water quality, have some kind of biosecurity contingency plan. Next slide. And that's the uh, and we're a little bit over the hour. I kind of went through that fairly quickly. But again, the point is fish will die. We will have water quality problems. And you need to be able to deal with those, these situations as they arise. 